typically when we begin thinking about theology of work, we go back to the beginning of the Bible, to Genesis 1, and, and there's lots of good reasons uh, to do that. But I want to go back to the beginning by going to the middle, uh, the middle of the Bible, more or less, Psalm 104. But it's uh, a psalm about the beginnings of the world, but it's also a psalm about God's continuing activity in the world. And so um, we often, when we think of Genesis 1, we imagine God worked, God stopped, and they kind of let things run their course. And, and, and even worse than that, God worked, God stopped, people messed up the world, and God kind of doubly withdrew in a sense, that not only was he done with what he did, he's also kind of repulsed by what he sees people doing, and so he lets the world run its course until Jesus paratroops in, grabs some souls, and then zooms back up to heaven, and, and the job's done, as it were. I think that's a really misleading way of reading Genesis, but it's easier to see how it's a misreading by dropping into Psalm 104, the ineffable glory of God there in verse 1. And then interestingly, verse 2, the Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. So it almost seems that as, as God prepares, as it were, to go forth outside himself to make something other than himself, that light becomes the kind of mode by which he unveils himself to the world, which is not even yet created. And uh, I wonder sometimes whether some of the language of Christ as creator may be, being very cautious here, may be tied into this image here. That you've got God in himself, and then when God expresses himself, goes outside himself towards something other, if only to create that something other, that this self-expression of God, which we could think verbally as the Word, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, all things came into being through him, uh, that another way of talking about that expression of God going towards the outside is, is the image of light. And Jesus, of course, says that he is the light of the world. So that's kind of bonus material may uh, help feed into some streams of the New Testament's reflections on how it is that Jesus is who God is. He's, he's God who expresses himself towards something other. But we'll leave that to uh, the theologians to sort through. Uh, critical thing is he then stretches out the heavens like the tents, lays the beam of his upper chambers on their waters, all very poetic imagery not meant to be taken as uh, scientific discourse here makes the clouds his chariot, rides on the wings of the wind, makes the winds his messengers. Messengers, of course, can also mean angels. And that's why uh, this is one of the few, really only verse that explicitly speaks about the creation of angels. Kind of bonus material, no extra charge for that. Um, so once he takes care of things up here in the cosmic dome, the sky region, and he sets the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. It says he covers it with the watery depths as with a garment. So those chaos waters back in Genesis 1, uh, they weren't there all the time. God created them as part of this process that he was going to uh, work through, that he sets it on its foundations, covers it with water, and then, as we're well aware, he makes the waters part and the dry land appears. And now that Water flows away from uh, the mountains into the valleys to the place you assigned for them, setting a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. So while Genesis uh, 1 speaks in these serene terms of God just um, speaking everything into existence, here there's a little more drama to it. At the sound of your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. Why does God... Uh, talk about his own creative act here in this way? Well, I think we're going to learn that towards the end of the psalm when uh, judgment looms. Do you notice that we've gone from primal creation, creation in the beginning, what God did, and we just flowed without a break to what God does, what God is doing right now. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. Okay, maybe you could say that's still setting up the conditions of earth in the beginning. 
but I think it's pretty clear by the time we get to verse 11 that we are in the present day of the psalmist. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. That river from the beginning just flows right up into the present day. And so while the psalm starts with what God did, it continues to describe what God is doing. And if we want to put it in terms of work, the theme of our class, what God worked at back then and in some sense finished in another sense he is still working but psalm 104 makes it clear that that creative work continues to this day and you'll notice the psalmist at this point from this angle is not interested in the fall of humanity and the rupture between god and humanity and the uh the shaking that that um engenders in the in the created order the disruption The waters are flowing serenely from God's creative acts in the beginning right into that little wild donkey quenching its thirst beside some Palestinian stream. Now we see why it's so relevant to considerations of human work that God's good creation is begun in the beginning. He continues to sustain that in its goodness, and we're a part of that not just in general, but our labor in particular is a part of the ongoing goodness of God's creative work. Our work reflects his work. And again, the psalmist is just not interested in this point about thorns and thistles, about why you hate your job and all those things which we will indeed next week begin to explore. The negatives. From this angle, the psalmist sees human labor as part of the good and indeed very natural ordering of the creation. There's an aspect of your work which just is and was and remains good, right? To the point where the psalmist can speak about in these kind of glowing terms. And and we all experience this, right? Even if it's intermittently. Even if it's just by way of memory of that one good day you had at your job, right? Or if it's just uh, the pleasure you derive from working in your garden or refinishing furniture or whatever it is, we do, in fact, I think, get a glimpse of the goodness of labor. And that's a critical point of departure for thinking about Jesus and your job, is if you think of work as simply a result of the curse, then you're going to be in a perpetually dysfunctional relationship with your labor, right? You're never going to think it's worth your time or investment. It's just all bad all the time. And even the good things that happen are really illusory, right? They're just on the surface, but they don't speak to anything real. The good news of Psalm 104 is that the goodness of work, when it's good, is real. And it's a foretaste of who we were created to be. The psalmist reiterates the the theme. How many are your works, Lord, the things you have done? Uh, In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And then he goes on that the the sea and Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there, or to sport about, as I think the the King James has it. Um, All creatures look to you to give their food at their proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they're terrified. When you take away their breath, They die and return to the dust. Again, God intimately involved in the processes that go on in what we call the natural world. There is a sort of independence the world enjoys. It's different from God, and yet there's a sense in which God continues to uphold it, sustain it, to destroy and to create again. Is that creation word there showing up in 30? You renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, what he has done, right? He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. And here that, again, sounds a little scary, and it's meant to because it'll become illuminated in the final verses. I'll sing to the Lord all my life. I'll sing praise to my God as long as I live. My meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Sounds like kind of a downer ending to what is arguably the most most beautiful and life-affirming psalm in the whole Psalter. But what this indicates is that 
the psalmist has not entirely forgotten about the fall. And so he intimates in these last verses, appropriately kind of quietly compared to all the life-affirming stuff he's been doing up to this point, but he affirms that God will finish up his creation project, that he began in the beginning, that he sustains day by day now, but which the psalmist knows is thwarted often by human wickedness. Nonetheless, the God whose creative power pushed those waters aside off the mountains long ago, he will be able to push the sin and chaos of human and humanity's defilement to the earth, he'll be able to get rid of that as well. And so he will finish up what he began and what he continues to do. But what I want to leave you with, God worked. He created in the beginning. It was good. And he keeps creating. He keeps nurturing and sustaining the world. He will finish it up. And in the meantime, our labor is at least in part, at least in principle, a good thing that fits in with the rest of his ongoing purposes for the creation.